welcome to episode six of the Manny Matsaka Show, where we give you insight on how to win on the field and optimize your life. Today's topic is an analysis and application of Ori Hoffmeckler's thought-provoking book, The Warrior Diet. Right, uh, to help me out with this, I've got uh, two uh, guests with me, two co-hosts, I guess, uh, and uh, we're going to work this out a little bit. Matt Wearhan has been on before when we did Do the Work. Yes, sir. Yeah, we had a good one on that. And, um, you know, obviously he's our linebacker coach and um, will give us some insight from his perspective. So everybody knows he's coming in not knowing anything <laughs> particular about the Warrior Diet. I, I want to I give you a couple different viewpoints. Uh, so he's going to hear some of this stuff firsthand. I just want to see how he reacts to it. Yeah, I was. I found out, I think, 8 o'clock this morning that I was doing There you this. go. That's so, the best way. I didn't want to give you any time to think about how to do yeah, it. It's almost 10 o'clock. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then we've got Noah Pistori, who is our intern here uh, and, uh, and is also a student here at Defiance College who has some background in um, – in diet, nutrition and diet. Uh, he, he took a class here, right? Yes, sir. Uh, okay, good. I uh, stayed at a Holiday Inn the other day, right? Yeah. Right, there you go. So you know a lot, right? <laughs> okay, so basically uh, Noah's going to give us some insight because he's, you know, he's a student athlete um, and he has been doing some research on this in the last 24 hours. Like, oh, okay, what is this thing that we're talking about that is the warrior diet? And, and Noah ultimately wants to uh, coach football as, uh, is what he, he wants to do after he's done with his career as an athlete playing here. So, you know, one of the things that I think is really um, an interesting thing to think about is what is really the ideal health and fitness for a football coach? Uh, and I, you think about it, you see so many different examples of this, but if you think about the demands of the job, because Matt, you've, you know, you've been doing this now, and what, um, j just give me you know, the elevator pitch is, hey, uh, you're going to become a football coach, uh, so here's, here's what your life is like. Uh, give me 30 seconds on what the life of a football coach <laughs> is. Uh, you're working anywhere from 8 to 16 hours a day. Uh, your eating habits are random. Uh, it depends on the day sometimes, and they're not good. You just eat whatever you want. I mean, I've, yeah. I've gone up to 280 before just because I wasn't working out. And I was eating all the time, but I was doing a lot of work in the office. Yeah. You sit around a lot, you know, and you're at your desk. If it's not in season, you're at your desk most of the time doing a lot of stuff. So. Yeah. So it is said it can be it can become sedentary. Correct. Yes. Right. You know, and, and you get that. And, and, and that's, you know, one area of this. I mean, no, how you sure you still want to coach? Oh, absolutely. OK. All right. Just yeah. checking. <laughs> but here, here are some things that I've seen, some examples of some really good coaches, you would say, hey, these guys are great coaches. I have some personal experience and then experience through somebody else that gave me some insight. You know, I know, um, you know, people listen to this, obviously, you know, that one of my mentors is Bill Snyder at Kansas State. And Bill, if you just Google uh, Bill Snyder, Taco Bell, <laughs> uh, it uh. probably would do it. And you find out that he, um, he, his lifestyle was such that he drank coffee pretty much all day long, which I, I believe I alluded to at one point in time. And then he would eat one meal at the end of the day. And oftentimes it was Taco Bell on the way home. I mean, they knew him at the drive through in yeah. Manhattan and, and, the, and the, the stories are legendary of that. So he really, uh, you know, he, he was so um, attuned to not eating throughout the day because yeah. he would always say, oh, it brings my energy level down. I, I remember asking him, so I'm thinking, this guy's living on coffee. And I didn't know until years later he had the Taco Bell fix at night, <laughs> you know, and he's, and he's a slight built guy. Seen, you know? Yeah, I've seen pictures. He's yeah. skinny. Yeah, so so you you have that going for you, but you wonder, okay, what nutrients are going in? And so, so that's Bill Snyder. That's how he was approaching that. As a coach, I mean, we would have pregame meals because they weren't at night, and he would just drink coffee. And as an assistant coach, I remember Bob Stoops walking around because he knew him more because Bob had been at Iowa as a player. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Bob was like, no, we, you, we can't be eating 
because he's not eating. So you're like pregame meal. So a lot of guys had to go eat before the meal. And you never yeah, yeah. ate with the team. A lot a lot of guys just didn't do that. Sure. And so you just walked. I learned to walk around with a cup of coffee during a pregame meal. You know, and that was basically how that would go. You know, so that's one example. You know, another guy that was, um, I talked about last week in my podcast was Joe Gardy. Mm-hmm. You know, Joe had been the... Um, you know, the, the long time uh, defensive coordinator for the New York Jets with the sack exchange defense and, you know, Klecko, Gastineau, Abdul Salam, all these great players that, you know, you go back and look at it. And, you know, so he had a big NFL background. Yeah. And uh, what, what was interesting about Joe was he was a big man. I mean, yeah. he had three bills plus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, he loved to eat. Yeah. You know, uh, his wife... Um, would always get him uh, to go on these fad diets, mm-hmm. you know, and, and and so one of the things with Joe's lifestyle was I can remember emphatically he'd always be on the Jenny Craig diet. So you'd have all these, I don't know if you know, they're like yeah, little yeah. pre-packaged things, right? Snacks throughout the day. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So that's what he would have. And he, he'd have that throughout the day thinking he's dieting and all this, you know, and he, he'd always drink. one after that. Well, it wasn't just that. Now you gotta understand. He he would leave the office. This was one time I drove back with him because uh Hofstra was uh in Nassau County in Hempstead. Uh-huh. He lived uh out I think it was in Sayville, which is in Suffolk County, which is out okay. closer yeah. to the Hamptons. So it was a it was a nice hour drive or so, I'm gonna sure. say. And so we would pull up and uh and, and we, you know, I would be in the car with him driving. This is just one time. And then I asked some guy in the office, oh, yeah, this is what he does. He pulled, he used to pull into the pizza shop, right? <laughs> and he would get a large, and, and back, you know, in New York, the pies are Big large, pies, large yeah. pepperoni, sausage, peppers, pepperoni, sausage, and pepper, something like that. Huge yeah. pie. And he would eat the thing on his hour drive home and then have dinner. And then have dinner, you know, so, you know, obviously the stress of things yeah. got to, might have got to him or he just he loved to eat. And we went to some of the nicest restaurants. I mean, he's the first guy that took me to uh, uh, Peter Luger's, which okay. is a steakhouse underneath the Brooklyn Bridge. And it's <laughs> legendary. It's like one of the top steakhouses on the planet. And uh, you, you, I mean, I'd never seen, had steak like right. that. Mm. I mean, it was unbelievable. So if you're in Brooklyn... Go check out Peter Luger's. There's one in Long yeah. Island now too, uh, since those days. But but that that's another guy, you know, and he would he would eat and think he was losing, you know, sort of like, oh, I'm on the Jenny Craig, so I can do whatever I want yeah. outside of it. Yeah. That, that's right. So that was part of it. And then the third guy is somebody that um a lot of people know who he is right now. And he is the head coach of the Kansas City Chiefs, okay, as Andy Reid. Mm-hmm. And Andy had been the head coach of the Philadelphia Eagles. So I was, when I was at Widener, uh, our head coach and our defensive coordinator, Bill Shue, were both assistants with Andy Reid and the Eagles. Okay. Uh, so I would get the stories of his, of the way he lived and, you know, and, and, and there were a lot of uh, donuts and sugary snacks and all this stuff, eating at bizarre times of the day, Sounds you know. Like my kind of guy. Yeah. <laughs> and understand, he was, an, a lot of people also you want to look at is like he was an offensive lineman at BYU yeah you know when they won the national championship I don't know if you knew that Noah I, I did not you didn't know th- he, he that BYU also, he yeah. won the pass punt and kick competition that was on sports center at the yeah time. a couple months ago you got the video of him when he was 13 and he's a monster out there <laughs> oh Boom yeah it. absolutely and I only yeah. hear good things about him as a person it's just you know he would have those diet issues go up and down and then then you hear of other guys that'll come out and they'll they'll uh you know, really big guys um, that balloon up, mm-hmm. and 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 you wonder how that is. Maybe they're guys that uh, you know they they had a surgery sure. afterwards to uh, limit the amount of nutrients going in, so they would lose weight that way. There's yeah. so many ways to do it. But Matt, just like you talked about, if you're going to coach in this profession and you want to be able to affect your players, wouldn't you want to? Th- you, you you would need some energy. Yeah. You need to make sure that you're eating right and at least yeah. working out and staying in some kind of shape. I know I have always felt best when I'm working out and I'm not just eating, eating, eating. And okay, that's 
I, I've been on both ends of it, you know. Yeah. Which is why you're here. Yeah. Okay. You didn't realize why you were here. I, yeah. I hate to say this. A week ago, I knew I was going to put you on this. I almost told you, but I'm like, nah, I'm going to hold off. Thanks, uh, but, well, good. and you'll see why mm. as we go through this, because I yeah. think a lot of us need to take a look as we head into this, because a lot of us need to take a look and say, you know what? Number one, if you're going to go on any type of a diet, lifestyle change, you, I'm telling you, you go through your doctor, make sure mm -hmm. you are fit to do the things you need to do, or you work your way to that. If you're not, then you don't do it. I mean, it's, you, you got to take care of yourself through a medical professional. Right? So this whole presentation goes this way. And what we're about to approach are some topics that are very, very uh, out of the box, very different uh, concepts. Uh, but I want to give that to you because I've always believed that take a look at it, see if it's true for you, do your own research, and then apply it. You know, because we could sit here and and say, hey, this is X, Y, Z is the best diet on the planet for this. I don't know those answers. Plus, everybody has a different uh, issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, they may they may have dietary issues, sure. allergies, and so forth. But but this, as we get into the warrior diet here, um, is interesting because it started to get for me. I'm looking at this and saying, you know, <laughs> we've been in lockdown for over two months. This pandemic, right? Yeah. And you can't go to the gym and work out. You, you, you know, I try to walk and do these things, and I've noticed, and I keep hearing from other coaches, you get. You get like two extremes, these coaches out there, right? You get like, hey, Joe workout guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he's always posting his videos of what he's yeah. doing, which how's that make you feel, Matt? <laughs> oh, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling great right now. I'm on my own little kick. So Yeah, see? But but you you notice that these guys are doing that, right? Yeah. And then and then the other guys, you could just see you get lethargic. You're sitting mm -hmm. in the house all the time. Maybe you're taking this, um, I'm not saying the pandemic deal to an extreme, but you're locked in the house. You, you're yeah. like ordering Amazon to get your food. You're, you know, mm -hmm. you, you're not, you're not getting sunlight. There's a lot <laughs> of things that people out there, that is actually happening. I've noticed yeah. even with some of our players that happens, you know, they just don't realize that you still need some things in life to get healthy. So a lot of us, some of us have gained some weight over the winter and then you start to get it into a time where maybe you may have been taking it off yeah and voila you're gaining again you know yeah. and you and you get into that and i think you know it can affect our health changing our weight fitness level sometimes our focus all these different things there's so many i mean i don't know yesterday i think the other day on instagram i put on there that i, I baked a, a bread you know, mm -hmm. and I got all these re oh, everyone's baking bread. Like if you go to the grocery stores, they're out of flour and yeast. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's like the latest thing, right? So knowing that that that's where we're sitting, how in the world can we make a shift? All right, if that is what we decide to do. You know, what might be uh, you know, Matt, what might be the ideal health and fitness level? for an aspiring coach or a coach that wants to bring energy and passion to his program? What, what would be the level of fitness you could see, you know? Well, I mean, the average fitness level should be something more of, it's not going to be what it was. Like, As a, a player, a, you mean? A lot, yeah, a lot of guys come back into coaching and try to keep on that same regimen and everything, and then they realize, they, I don't need to. And mm -hmm. a lot of them either stop working out altogether or they just start eating and eating and eating you get the health and fitness guys that are really into it and they enjoy it they like the meal prep they like to go and do the research and yeah maybe eat. the strength coach yeah, yeah you know and and that's great um i was never a huge weight room guy i i never fell in love with it um but i love food yeah right <laughs> and that's I mean, well, I you're, East, you're from New Jersey. So yeah, that's half have, of your problem. I got three brothers, and <laughs> the way that I eat's bad too. I I eat fast because I had three brothers, and if you didn't eat oh, right away, yeah. you know, you might lose some things or off your plate. So you had to make sure you were <laughs> going fast. So I even to this day, I'll. I mean, I inhale stuff. You know, I forget to breathe sometimes while I'm eating. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, yeah, when I stopped playing, I just kept eating. You know, I didn't, I ate like I was still working out and did not work out. And that's, mm -hmm. you have to make a major shift when you get out of playing and get into coaching. 
Um, I mean, ideal fitness level is just to be in shape, in some kind of shape where uh, you're not, you're not, I I don't want to use this term, but you're not a mouth breather, you know, Uh you're not somebody that you're, you're sitting there and you're breathing heavy, you Mm -hmm. know, and everybody hears you in the room when you're breathing. You know, I've, I've met a lot of guys like that in our profession where they're bigger and they have to struggle a little bit more to breathe. And um, that I think is a bad look for the players to see, you know, Um, you'd, you'd ideally like to be in a better, in better shape than that. Yeah. Okay. So, so you're trying to set that up. How, yeah. how do you know it as a player, you know, perceive your coaches, the fitness level of your coach? Does it have anything to do? I mean, you know, there's, there's all different kinds. I mean, if Andy reads your coach, you know, there's a certain yeah. amount of, okay, I get he's Andy Reed, you know, but, but, <laughs> yeah. but, but how do you perceive that knowing you want to eventually get into that profession? I mean, uh, you know, it always is a good thing to uh, feel the the energy from a coach um, when, like, for me as a long snapper, it's cool that Coach Yeomans, uh, when it's, when, you know, he's, he works out, he has his own regimen, and then when, you know, if I need some help on something and he can actually go and show me, you know, he can snap the ball way, you know, way better than I can, and it's just nice to have that uh that aspect that i can really be shown like the physic the physicality of like what i'm doing and how mm-hmm. to correct it um and i know a lot of uh a lot of the defensive backs on the team really like that about coach johnson mm-hmm. um and they you know they like to go up and challenge him on one on ones every once in a while with the receivers and everything but um i definitely think it it really does help with the uh a little bit of motivation a little bit of friendly competition between the coaches and the players mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's interesting because you get that. And it's like, Hey, if Andy Reed came and was your coach, it's, it might be different, you know, Bill Parcells in his day. I mean, you've got different body types, different, um, different things going. But one thing I do notice is the great coaches all have, they've got a lot of intellect. They've got great, a lot of brain power. So they're, you know, whatever it is through their passion and energy, they can bring it across and, and you've got different ways to do that. I mean, I've noticed that, the three things that I look at that as I'm getting ready for a season or that I notice can make a difference are, you know, having g- great energy, um, uh, brain power is the other one. You know, a lot of times you get brain fog from some of the stuff you're eating, possibly. Something I never knew about when I was your age, brain fog. What is that, you know? But it, it, you can do some research and it, it does exist. Uh, and it is based on your diet. And then the other thing I sort of put these two together is structure and strength. It's like you want to be sort of like Coach Warehand says, it's like you want to have, you want to be fit, you know, whatever level is works for you. But I think structure is important because if you're not flexible, mm-hmm. you get low back pain and you're, and you're having to go to the chiropractor, you're getting shots or whatever it is because of the pain you're living in. I think structure and strength go hand in hand. Because you, you can get too much in the weight room, then all of a sudden yeah. you hurt yourself, yeah. and then how does that affect you and your ability sure. to coach? So you know those are the things that I, I I think I if there's a sort of a triumvirate of things that I sort of keep on top of my mind, say hey I got to get there. You know we always improving in those areas, and it's like I believe that one's lifestyle directly correlates with his results in the classroom and on the field. I mean, I, I think lifestyle is more important than, per se, diet, mm-hmm. you know. And I know, Noah, the other day we were talking, and you made a statement to me. I, you know, I quote you. I'm wherever you got it from. It's a, you know, it has been said that 80% of health and fitness is based on what you eat, mm-hmm. not your exercise pattern. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So where did you come up with it? Where did you hear that? Um, I've, you know, I follow different social media accounts that have, uh, you know, fitness tips. And, uh, I mean, my, my major is exercise science. So I, I like to be up to speed with that, uh, with all those kinds of facts and things. Um, um, and I've just seen it and it really is, uh, the, that percentage, I mean, might not be completely accurate, but, uh, the basis behind it is just that, um, what you take in is a lot a lot of people think that the, you know, just being in the gym all the time and mm-hmm. running all the time is what really gets you that fit lifestyle. But it's more about 
like you said, a structure yeah. and that lifestyle, and especially what you're putting into your body that yeah. really uh, fuels what you can put out in the weight room or yeah. in a workout. Let's take a look right now at some various diets that are out there today or have been in vogue at certain times. You know, the book uh, gives you a little bit of insight, but I'm just curious if you have any um, personal insight on them or know somebody that's done some of this stuff. You know, number one, you've got the all American diet, you know, the, the fast food diet, the, mm -hmm. that type of thing. You know, a lot of people that, and that's, that's what they go on. You know, uh, you've got diets that are low fat diet. So watch how much fat you put in your body, you know, which, which is interesting. There was a, you know, Dean Ornish, a Pritikin diet. Some of this stuff is that you've got other stuff that uh, sort of balances things out uh, called the zone. You know, it's like uh, protein, fat, carb ratio in a 40, 30, 30 split by percent. That's how they do. Uh, you've got high protein, low carb diets like the Atkins diet. Um, you know, uh, South Beach diet is, yeah. is another one that, that was popular at one point. And then you've got some holistic diets, you know, fit for life and uh, different types of macrobiotic. You can go on in any bookstore today yeah. and go to the diet section and you it's it may have more books than anything between that and self-help, I, I can see <laughs> diet and self-help are the two largest areas in a bookstore. And, yeah. you know, I, I went back the other day and I, and I just grabbed how many diet books do I have? Because I don't throw books away, you know, right. and I, I couldn't bring them all in. I mean, yeah. there's so many. I think if I had put them on the ground, they would be, you know, up to my shoulder, just stacked up. There's yeah. so many diet books out there. And so what, what are some things that um, maybe you've tried or you, you've heard of in well, this area? The one that worked for me when I lost a ton of weight was it was called the fast metabolism diet mm -hmm. and I forget who wrote it but she basically gives you the schedule gives you all the foods you can have all this stuff it's planned out by the hour pretty much um but basically the, the premise is to reset your metabolism after years of just pounding away at it. Okay. and it I did it with my parents I was still living at home at the time and this is uh I was working at the high school. Um, I was at 280. This was at my peak. And my parents... Now, now mind you, 280, and how old were you? I was 25. 25, 280. And when you graduated high school, what did you weigh? 220. Okay. So I, I just I, want to put it I, on perspective. I played, I played at 255. That okay. was my heaviest when I was playing. Um, but then as soon as I stopped playing, blew straight up to 280, and I okay. was there for about two years. Mm. Um and then once we got on this diet, my parents, they were also a little bit bigger than the, what they wanted to be. Uh, I dropped 30 pounds in a month. Mm -hmm. And it's all about what you eat, how often you eat it, at what times, and what portions you eat, that kind of thing. So it was very structured. And I was lucky to have my parents around because I wouldn't have done it by myself. My, mom, my mom made sure to, like, the dinner was mm -hmm. already going. You know, she, she did everything with the cooking and, and all that. But we had to make sure we had snacks at certain part of the day. So I'd pack up like a, a cup of nuts going to school, you know. And Interesting. Like yeah. you, you just snack on those in between meals. And it was, it worked for me. I ended up losing. I got back down to 220 at one point. Now, Holy smokes. I, I actually, I got sick. So the last 10 pounds was kind of a, yeah. it was a cheat code. <laughs> I, I ended up getting really sick and I lost a bunch of weight because I was in bed for a week. And mm -hmm. um, But the lowest, I was down to 230, 220. Um, and that stayed off for a while. Once after that first month, I really got in I, a lot more energy because you don't have to work out on this diet. It was mm -hmm. one of those where you're literally just resetting your metabolism and eating the right stuff. And after a month, my body felt great and I started getting back into the weight room. And that's where I started putting on some like muscle again. And I started getting leaner and getting uh, stronger and just feeling like the best version of myself. And that's that took me through the summer into the football season. And that's when I started to. Oh, mom wasn't eat. around to cook. You didn't yeah, have the yeah. support system. Yeah, I was, I was in the office until 10 PM most nights, you know, yeah. I was, I was not around. So, um, I didn't put it back on. Like, I think 
my heaviest since that point has been about 250. Okay. Um, maybe 260. I might. Mm-hmm. I think I was about 260 a couple months ago when I got here. Cause I, <laughs> but it sounds like it was tough to make it a lifestyle. I it's a tough know. lifestyle if you want to keep it that way. But uh-huh. um, it's once In you do it, once you do it for a couple months, that weight will stay off because you reset your body, you reset your gotcha. metabolism. So it's going to take a lot more time and a lot more effort to crap on it again. You oh, know? okay. Like, you know, Got so it. It, unless unless you start going and eating McDonald's every day, it's still going to work for you for at least a sure. good amount of time. Yeah. Um, but it's a good way to help. Ch- that's that's what worked for me. For you, it was years, a great jump start. Sounds years like ago, it. yeah, and that okay. that got me back to living a healthier lifestyle. Mm-hmm. That's for sure. So. Now you know the other day, Noah and I were talking about the dieting and so forth, and uh, you were in a, you took a class. Yeah. Here with Kevin Tong, mm-hmm. our, our athletic trainer, mm-hmm. and um, it was uh, what, what was the class and uh, what diet did you um, research on yourself? Um, so it was a uh, sports and nutrition class, and one of our assignments was to pick a a fad diet, um, and I chose the paleo diet, and really it was just for the sake of the paper, <laughs> but I wanted to try it out, uh-huh. um, and I mean. The paleo diet, it was, it was nice, but it was really hard on a uh, college budget and, <laughs> okay. and being an, uh, a student athlete. It's a lot of meat, right? Yeah. So yeah, it's, meat's not cheap. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it's, you know, you can eat, you know, 20 ounces of, you know, vegetables and different yeah, yeah. carbs and then mm-hmm. with some meat in there, as opposed to, I'm just going to eat 20 ounces of chicken. I mean, it's. And at the time, I was also counting my calories because I was trying okay. to gain weight. Oh, which okay. gotcha. With the paleo diet, it just was kind of counteracting what I was trying to do. <laughs> yeah, so it was sure. just a lot of meat, a lot of vegetables. Uh, no, no, nothing that would uh, come into like the agriculture era uh, with like oh, potatoes. Okay. Almost like Atkins. Yeah. Um, so no carbs, basically. Yeah, no carbs. Well, the only carbs I could have was from. Uh, vegetables and fruits, okay. but they could only if they were cooked, they could only be steamed. Uh, so nothing, no butter, no no oils or anything to put on them. Uh-huh. Um, no breads, no milk, uh, or any kind of dairy. Yeah, that's wow. It's not my cup of tea. Well, yeah, <laughs> but but it's very popular. Yeah. I mean, yeah, let's not kid ourselves that that you you go paleo and just Google paleo diet, you're gonna get so many hits. And the premise of that is like to eat what the cave it's the caveman diet yeah right? okay. yeah yeah that's another way they i, seen I it, actually yeah. saw something on that before and um like there's a lot of the criticism is that our digestive systems have changed so mm-hmm. much since then that it doesn't have the same effect yeah and mm-hmm. i don't know if that's true uh i've seen some different things on it i've watched some uh some documentaries on it that okay. have you know just different Could perspectives yeah. that yeah, some sure. people it really helps some people they just can't live that lifestyle yeah yeah Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, you can see that. That's why I think everyone has a unique way to go about it. Some mm-hmm. things, obviously, paleo works for a lot of people, or it wouldn't be so popular. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, but I do see once again this it's the same thing as Matt was talking about is the difficulty of staying on this yeah. long term as a lifestyle is tough because I'm I'm hearing things like okay, these things it deals with a lot of calories or uh, percentage of things that you're of protein to fat to carbs when a lot of timing things and all that. So I I think that can be a bit of an issue Mm -hmm. on, on some of these diets staying with them because I've tried them. I've tried different types of things. You know, I, I recently was really into this here. It's the bulletproof diet. Yeah. And you know, this guy, Dave Asprey, which this is interesting as well. I mean, it's got a whole different way of looking at it. Um, of what you can do to lose weight, reclaim your energy and focus, and basically upgrade your life. That's what he's saying here. And it it works. Um, it, it's just financially, mm-hmm. it's not it's not uh, cheap, okay, mm-hmm. to do to buy all this stuff, which I'm saying, hey, it, it's probably more important that you do that as opposed to buy something else, you know, yeah. that, that you're, if you reallocate where your budget's going, you could do a lot of this stuff. But there's some of this stuff that rang so true, and I've read a few of his books that at some point we, we'll come back and, and revisit that. But I want to shift now because 
some things I learned in the Bulletproof. And then years ago, I was renting a house, okay, in Asheville, North Carolina, renting a house. And um, just because I would go back and forth from there to Columbus, Ohio, I was Mm -hmm. running a business, running a house. And the lady who I rented her house, I don't remember her name, but I remember what she was doing. She was a writer. She was an author. And she went, she left, she rented me her house for six months. So it was almost like before Airbnb, I was yeah. doing it. Nice house in the mountains in North Carolina. And I had access to the house so I could go down there. You know, my older children were down in Asheville at the time. So I went down and saw Michael and Meredith. And I was in this house and she was really into health and wellness. I could tell. And she said, I have your way, whatever you want to take a look at in here. And, you know, tons of books and all this, yeah. you know, everything. And I'm looking because she had left for six months to write a book. It was like a real spiritual based book. Um, and she went to, I think, Mount Athos in Greece, like some, oh, wow. where some monastery is up there, mm-hmm. at, to get away huh. and write a book in six months. So that's who this lady, you know, that's who she was, and she, that's what she did. So I'm in her house, and I'm looking through, and I find this book, and it's not this. It was the first edition mm-hmm. of this book called The Warrior Diet, and I'm like, it just seems so different. And I start looking. So I start it then. I'd say, let me try this, and it's like, interesting you know I'm, I'm i'm intrigued by it and it really worked at that point in time and, I, and this and i'd sort of put it away and you know you get into different things and you check them out but i think initially what i want everybody to say is who this guy is that wrote the book mm-hmm. ori hoffmeckler okay and um let's, let's go right to the book here we'll take a look at what it says about the author ori hoffmeckler is a modern renaissance man whose life has been driven by two passions art and health His formative experience as a young man with the Israeli Special Forces prompted life interest in diet and fitness regimes that would help improve human survival. After the army, Hofmeckler attended the, uh, I'll butcher this name, Bezalel Academy of Art and the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, where he studied art, philosophy, and biology and received a degree in human sciences. So interesting that's his background he's a well-known painter you know thus the whole renaissance man bit you know which which makes a lot of sense he published uh, he has a lot of other books out there and yeah he's got his own website and there are people all over the world that have tried his stuff and have had success with it so that's ori hoffmeckler and we'll have some links here um, on the website uh, to give you to take a look at, you know, who this guy is and a whole lot more, you know. So you got an Israeli special forces guy who studies the history of the warrior culture. That's where this comes from. And there are so many fascinating lessons from history that blew me away. And I think it just sort of rang like, I, I liked reading it because it was like reading a history book. Mm-hmm. Like, how did people live in these warrior cultures back in those days. And, and it is fascinating when you look at it. It's like, what was he talking about? And how did he know this? Because he was so fascinated by the whole idea of this. So let me give you a, an excerpt from the book here to give you an idea from history that, that you may not know. You know uh, he goes, uh, the mighty Roman soldier was a lightweight. 135 pounds on average. Yet in face-to-face combat against Gauls or Celts who weighed about 180 pounds, the Roman warrior came out on top. Julius Caesar was only five feet, six inches tall, and Alexander the Great wasn't physically a big man. But history remembers them both as giant warriors. One might ask why history and legend remembers these lean people as giants. In my opinion, the answer lies somewhere between the way these people lived and how adamantly they followed their convictions. I've chosen to focus mainly on the ancient Romans and Greeks for two reasons. First, the Greco-Roman culture is considered to be the foundation of modern civilization. Western cultural ideals of beauty and body proportions are derived from the Greco-Roman classical period. Second, I find the Greeks and especially the Romans to be great historical examples of people who created large empires and documented their warrior way of life over hundreds of years. There's a lot to learn from ancient warriors, 
but since this isn't a history book, I've limited myself to major topics relevant to the warrior diet. To understand what made these people live as they did, you need to get acquainted with their priorities. What were their aesthetic and moral concepts of beauty and ugliness? What did courage and cowardice mean to them? How did they relate to subjects such as health and sickness? And especially, what were their attitudes toward pain, pleasure, deprivation, and compensation? I find it all most intriguing. I hope you will too. So that's how he starts to get into what this deal is all about. Mm -hmm. Did you have any idea that Romans were 135 pounds? The average warrior? No, it doesn't surprise me just because I know that humans have evolved so much since then, but I mean, that's still it's pretty small. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is, right? I mean, that, that it's amazing what how it was back then because, you know, they, they could obviously, you can go back in time and historians can, can see that and verify this, and this is what he's been able to do, you know? And one thing I thought was interesting in looking at the history side of this book, the lessons from history, as he has, has it in here, he goes... He makes a, is a quote that the ancient Greeks had, he go, and they, they used to say, tell me what you eat, with whom, and how, and I will tell you who you are, right? Now, think about that, because the first time I read it, I was like, okay, there's more to this than just what you eat. Evidently, yeah. there's a lifestyle involved with this, mm-hmm. as, as we will get into this, because he goes, once again, tell me what you eat, with whom, and how. Yeah. All right. And I will tell you who you are. To me, it was a wild statement like, oh, OK, that's interesting. All right. So I was able to get some things out of that that made a lot of sense. And it's like, I think there's a lot to be learned from the past. Because what did you, you called the paleo, the caveman diet, yeah. right? Yeah. Obviously, there is some um, correlation to that in, sure. in looking at a specific culture of warriors. You know, I've seen over time where there have been studies that are done where, um, you know, that there, there's some village in Japan where people live to be 110 yeah. years average of yeah. age or something, and they look, well, what are they eating? Right. In, in Okinawa, or I think, or something like that. You yeah. know, it's some diet based on that. Mm-hmm. So he just basically went back and said, hey, I'm going to go take a look at what these warriors were eating. And what their lifestyle was, and see what the ancient warrior diet looked like. Yeah. Now, I want to preface this. This isn't, you, you'll see in a little bit where this is where it came from, but it's not what the warrior diet is specifically sure. for the modern man. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So you, you, you look at this, and you, what he noticed it is in the book, it's, he calls it the Greco Roman warrior cycle. All right. And let, let me go back to the book for this uh, and, and give you some insight what Ori is saying. He goes, Romans cycled between extremities of deprivation and compensation. All right? A typical cycle was based on intense activity during the day and relaxation during the night. There was also a yearly cycle based on the seasons. All right? So spring through summer was a time for war and work. Winter was a time for peace. Autumn was the transition between war and peace. And it was the season for what they called the games, the, you know, the Olympic game type mentality where they would train and do different things like that. And what happens is that the act, they, 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 he noticed that the activities of the Roman warrior were also dictated what they Eight. It, it was, there was a certain relationship they were dealing with, you know, and daytime activities, you know, he says here, daytime was dedicated to work and war, right? A Roman had to struggle throughout the day dealing with physical stress and anxiety. Being alert was part of the daily routine. Luxuries, pleasures, and ostentation were not allowed, okay? So that's Interesting to note, this is during the day. The only function of food during the day was to restore strength. That was it. People ate standing up. Right? In times of necessity, such as during war campaigns, soldiers ate only dry biscuits and water. 
Given this, Romans in general didn't like dry food. They ate it for nourishment only. When people traveled, they often ate bread and figs, and, and they didn't have the time or facilities to cook meals in the day. So that, that's how that would work for them. So during the day, that's how they would operate. It was almost a foraging mentality mm -hmm. is what they were doing. And, and, and you'll see where this starts to relate. Now, the Roman, having the book a big yes with an exclamation point on this, the evening pleasures. This is what you so you work all day. All right? And then at night, all right, the Roman evening was dedicated to relaxation, pleasure, and social, socialization, including family gatherings. This time was organized around the evening meal called the Sena, C-E-N-A. Roman citizens went to public baths early evening. Taking a bath was a transition ritual between the physical agitation and anxiety of the day and the leisure activity of the evening. Right? It was essential for people to relax at night, avoid all signs of being troubled or worried. They did not talk business. Right? The wealthy had their slaves, which Roman slaves were often the Greeks. I, I didn't know that, but the, the Greek slaves were the ones that, um, you know, they were the musicians or the artists, mm -hmm. and uh, they also would tutor the Romans. On, and it's why a lot of this, it's called the Greco-Roman yeah, yeah. era, because the Greeks influenced the Romans through that, yeah. yeah, through educating them, basically. So he goes in here, he goes, those who couldn't relax were thought to be suffering from a stiff or corrupted soul. All right. Given all these relaxation rules, Romans, with their warrior discipline, always retained a cer certain level of alertness. They sat on Roman chairs, which had no back, and practically allowed them to wear a sword while re remaining alert. The evening relaxation prepared them for sleep. Sleep was essential for a Roman who had to awaken at dawn. All right, so early risers. Insomnia was considered a sign of weakness remorse, regret, worry, longing, or having a bad conscience. Hmm. You know, so, so, you know, it's interesting, you know, if you're always getting up in the middle of the night and I've been there, you're worried about stuff, yep. that's what's happening here. And it's like, to understand what was going on and the way that culture was, you could just see the feasting at night yeah. and the socialization, um, which is really important, listening to music, doing those things. I mean... I don't know. How, how does that appeal to you as a lifestyle? What is working during the day and then feasting at night? Yeah, that's uh, honestly, that's kind of what I'm doing now. Yeah, I don't, I don't eat anything during the day. And then between two and 10, that's when I'm allowed to eat. So Sweet. <laughs> See, how about that? Yeah. OK, coaches discovering this along the way. But let me let me give you some more insight on what he's saying. Yeah. And where this thing goes. That's, that's one of the reasons when you told me what you were doing, I'm like, ah, let me see if I can bridge the gap. And <laughs> yeah, maybe yeah. there's a way to, to take a challenge on, you know? Yeah. Here, here's another area here on alcohol rations. <laughs> I had no idea. I had no idea about this. Don't it, talk about this. <laughs> well, it's, it, it's, it's, I have a wow next to this, yeah. okay? And he goes here, I find it interesting to note that army rations of wine and beer in early modern Europe were pretty high. For instance, daily rations of wine for the Spanish Navy during the 16th century were over a liter per soldier a day. Okay, for wine. Okay. Daily ra rations of beer and wine for Russian army soldiers in the 18th century were three and a half liters for wow. beer and a quarter of a liter for wine. So not as much per day. Okay. Wow. Right? A British seaman, Navy officer, okay, Navy personnel, during the Napoleonic Wars enjoyed a daily ration of up to four and a half liters of beer. Jeez. So that's what these warriors are doing. You know, it's sort of funny at the end, he goes, given these rations, one may wonder about the role that alcohol played in historical war campaigns. <laughs> that's true. Isn't that yeah. crazy? I mean, it's unbelievable when, you, when wow. you go back in time and you see what this was like. But, you know, these warriors were whining and dining in ancient Rome. You know, yeah. that's what it was. But they worked their tails off all day. Yeah. And that that is what came across to me. 
Now, there was actually, if you, I, as I, to condense all this and what I learned from it was back then, it was a foraging mentality throughout the day. Um, and then when it came time for the evening meal, there was a transition. And then I think the social aspect was huge because you got people together. Maybe the women were cooking all day. You come home, they smell the food. Yeah. You're, you know, you think about it like, let's say you're out and you're, you're hunting, you know, go back in the day. And then you, you come home and I don't mean to make, be sexist about it, but your wife and your girlfriend or whatever, they're cooking the food and you come back and it's fantastic. You know, yeah. it's, it's that mentality. And that's what these guys were doing. But what was interesting is that they would, they would eat their evening meal in a systematic way. Yeah. All right? and, and the Romans had their specific ways of doing it. And it would start off, you know, first it was a, it's some type of an appetizer, something that had taste to it, you know, some flavor to it. And then it would transition to the, the main course, which back in those days included, you know, wild boar, you know, ch good chicken, fish, those types of things, a protein source. And then they would work their way through and then they would finish with a dessert, which could be fresh fruits, apples, grapes, figs. Those are some, that's the way that they would eat their meal, all right? And, you know, with... And and even like with wine, drinking wine, is, this was interesting. I never thought about this. It's like wine is too strong to drink it with your meal early in it. Mm -hmm. right? So what they would do is they would have a, let's say they have a good wine. They would, they would water it down. They would yeah. take wine yeah. and make it half and half with water mm -hmm. and that's what they would drink and they would get huh. the nutrients from the wine and yeah. and okay. you could drink a lot more of it obviously or, you know more drinking of, of sure. fluids so i mean that's you know there was always a steady supply of both wine and meat mm -hmm. in this in that particular diet you know the, the spartan soldiers were sort of known for that yeah. they come home and you know and, and that's what that's how they went about doing it. And the carbs were later in the meal. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that was another point that... So you didn't fill up on bread early on. Exactly. Gotcha. Yeah. So Because, you know, when you look at this, and he, he does make a, um, an interesting note that when you look at the art from those days, you can see what the warriors look like, the Spartan war. I mean, you have a picture of a Spartan warrior. If you ever saw the movie 300, yeah. th that's a depiction of holy smokes. That's what they look like. They're yeah. lean, they're powerful, right. you know, he, you know, King Leonidas and the 300 against Xerxes and the Persian, you know, it's like, yeah. he just got after it. And, you know, even though there, there are details of that, that are for another story, <laughs> you know, something I would tell the team would be a good story, but it, it's, it's interesting because you get that, Right. And what happened is you have the Greek and the Roman cultures of warriors being that way. And then in in other parts of the world that didn't eat this way, where they started yeah. to chant like Egypt. Mm -hmm. If you look at the Egyptian art, um, they're soft. Yeah. The features are almost feminine on the men, mm -hmm. you know, and and. It, and you know, or he says it, it's because of the diet. It, it's like all yeah. of a sudden they're eating things at di in different ways than the warriors would eat. Yeah, sure. You know, I've, I've even seen there, there was a time where there's, there's a book out there just on sugar. When sugar, refined sugar, that, that people have won wars because they would ship sugar to the enemy and soften them up. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, so all this stuff, it, it, it starts to, it, it was, for me, it was able to connect these dots, you know, it's like, shoot, there's, there were rules of eating, you know, the alcohol rations were, were interesting. I, I had yeah. no idea about that, you know, and then you look at it and you say, enter what today's warrior diet is like. And, you know, th this is where Ori has done all the research and he gives you some things and understand this isn't biochemistry that it, this is more like lifestyle research social right. yeah, sociological yeah. right because i can't sit there and say I haven't, I haven't found any like documentation but i do notice some other diets out there that people are into mm -hmm. that are similar like the concept of intermittent fasting yeah which, right? is, which is what i'm doing right now right yeah, yeah. And, and that's what's in here on this and it's like it's important i think to understand 
what he is what he concluded after studying the warrior cultures. Right? And and here's what here's what Ori says here. He goes, I've tried to relay the story of ancient warriors in a brief, objective, and factual way. But how can anyone be completely objective or know for sure how people lived centuries ago? It is my considered opinion that the warrior diet is an updated ancient diet. I think it would be impractical to follow an ancient diet without taking into account the changes that occurred over time and how these changes affect our lives today. Human nature hasn't changed at all, but the world certainly has. Since we know much more today about the science of nutrition and its effects on the human body and mind, I was able to create a diet based on old principles with, with appropriate adjustments made for the 21st century. So, pretty interesting. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that... I mean, that tells me where he got it from. I think it gives our listeners out there a little bit more insight on it. So um, would you like to know a little bit about the way he goes about this? Yeah, let's, yeah. let's hear it. Let's take a look. Cool. All right. So what he does is he looks at this in two different phases. Um, so he's taking a look at this, and he has the undereating phase and the overeating phase. Now, you know, we we alluded to intermittent fasting, mm -hmm. right? And there's some really good research out there. I listened to a TED talk that we'll put a link up there of a lady talking about intermittent fasting, how good it is, uh, specifically for women, sure. it, it, because a lot of women will struggle with uh, weight loss, and how she's been able to help so many out with this intermittent fasting. And intermittent fasting is, uh, I mean, um, I mean, I know. What, what is it, uh, Matt? What what is intermittent fasting to you right now? Well, I want to preface this by saying I don't. I I've done zero research. I heard it from my yeah. brother. My brother did some research, and he lost like thirty pounds and or forty pounds in three months. That's okay. what he said. Um, and he said he did some light research, and he said his uh, he doesn't eat anything until like he has an eight hour window to eat, and he can eat whatever he wants, however much he wants, but he doesn't eat the rest of the day, and so I took that, and he said his was 2 to 10. So I said, okay, 2 to 10. I'll eat whatever I want, uh, however much I want. So it was an eight-hour window to eat. Eight-hour window to, to eat. And what I found is I, I don't – I'm not very hungry anymore. Mm -hmm. um, my body is, I, I guess, breaking down a lot of the stuff that is um, left over from the day uh, before instead of trying to get energized mm -hmm. in the morning by a big breakfast or something like that. I drink coffee in the morning. And then uh, usually I don't eat anything until four or five sometimes because I'll get okay. my I'll get my workout in around two or three o'clock, um, and then I'll eat after that. And I, I still eat whatever I want. I don't. I'm not calorie counting, or I mean I'm not eating the best stuff. But I find that I'm not eating nearly as much as I was, and I'm actually saving some money. <laughs> Um, yeah, for any kind of budget friendly thing. I mean, you don't have, you're not buying for three meals a day anymore. You're buying for one. And I do have some snack food and stuff because that's what I usually do. I'll eat one big meal and I'll either have snacks before or after. Okay. And being a guy who enjoys his, uh, his, his beverages, his beer, mm -hmm. you know, um, I cut myself off at 10 o'clock. Like I'll, I'll have one or two. And if it's 10 o'clock, I'm done, you know? Okay. Um, but then after that, it's just water. Yeah, and that's that's the big thing, too. If you're hydrating, that's massive. You, you know, water will get everything going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's that's kind of what I've been doing. I, again, no research. Just took my brother's advice, and it's been working. i am been doing it for about a month. I feel great mm -hmm. uh, working out, and I've probably lost about 10 pounds. I couldn't, okay. couldn't tell you for sure because I don't have a scale. I just know that I do... I have lost some weight. I can tell looking at myself in the mirror and seeing that I've trimmed down a little bit. So sweet. So yeah. that's intermittent fasting. I mean, defined. I mean, I, it's not hard, right? I'm, I'm good with strict guidelines. You know, if I tell myself, "Hey, I can't eat before two o'clock and I can't eat after ten o'clock," I can live with that. Mm -hmm. Where before, if you're like, "Well, you have to portion it out. You do this. You do that." There are so many steps that you have to take to make sure you're following the guidelines. That's tougher for me. But yes. if I tell myself, hey, you can't eat during this time, okay. 
Mm-hmm. I can, I can, I can tough that out, you know. And I, I get hungry around twelve every once in a while, but like, oh, it's twelve o'clock, can't eat yet. Yeah, but you're having, you're gonna have coffee. Is I, what you've been doing? Yeah, some I, I have some coffee, and uh, if I'm after I'm done with my pot of coffee in the morning, I just get a glass of water and just keep recycling that mm-hmm. until I eat. You know? Interesting, almost an adjusted warrior diet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in a way, by yeah. using intermittent fasting, because I mean, this book is written. I mean, the first edition was twenty some years ago. Yeah, and and so you could see back then this would have been considered heresy. Nowadays, intermittent fasting is like, oh, okay, yeah, it's 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 a popular. There's even, yeah. um, I know my brother Louis had told me about this, and we'll put the link for this. There's an app on you can get on your iPhone, probably Android too. That it, it's all about fasting, and it's like when you finish your last meal, you click it. And then you write in, this is how I feel. And mm. then and then it'll tell you whatever the amount of fat. Like in yours, it might be 16.8 uh, or 18.6, you know, on yeah. as far as, and you set the cycle on how you want to do it. Mm-hmm. So there is an app just for that. But we'll, we'll make a note to put that uh, with this uh, on the website at uh, mannymatsakis.com. Now, one of the things that's different about this is he doesn't call it and maybe when it was written or whatever, the word intermittent fasting wasn't as popular. He calls it controlled fasting. Yeah. Right? And let me share with you what he says okay. controlled fasting is, because it is, it, it, it's, it's good to compare it to what you're talking about, sure. Coach. And he goes, the undereating phase can be followed by not eating anything which is one of the things we're talking about. Some people like water fasts. Other prefer to drink coffee or tea and water. Okay, there's, you know, that alludes to what we just spoke about. This is okay if it's what you like to do. Moreover, okay, these are extreme methods that won't appeal to, mo- to most people. All right. Okay, however, here he, go- he goes, I believe the best way of going through the undereating phase is by following a controlled fast, not a water fast. Because controlled fasting is easier to follow and it accelerates detoxification and overall well-being. Controlled fast. Worth noticing. Now, his deal is different because the fasting, be it what you're going to find out what it, what it is here as far as controlled fasting, is 20 hours. And then you eat for four hours. Okay, so that that's there. And so uh, just so you know, on the front end, that's what he's talking about. To practice the undereating phase, it's crucial to understand what controlled fasting and hunger are, as well as their respective aspects. This is essential information, in other words, required reading for following the warrior diet. And here it is briefly what happens. Um, he and, and there's a lot of science in this, you know, obviously his background. And, you know, for me, I absorbed it because my degrees in biology and I thought, sure. oh, this is cool stuff, you know? And, and it, it, it sits in here on pages 14 and 15 of the book. So he hits it on the front end, but without getting into the details of this, uh, what, what's important to understand is when you fast, your insulin drops and your hormone glucagon increases to ensure a steady supply of energy to the body. When glucagon dominates, most of the body's energy is derived from glycogen reserves and fat stores. Aha, you start mm-hmm. to burn fat through this, right? Also, the drop of insulin allows the growth hormone to peak. Elevation of growth hormone increases the body's capacity to rejuvenate, repair tissues, and burn fat. A natural elevation of growth hormone on a daily basis, he goes, I believe, should help slow the aging process. Unfortunately, growth hormone is generally inhibited during the daily hours. Mm -hmm. Chronic low growth hormone levels are associated with sluggish metabolism, high insulin levels, and aging. Most people suffer from a sluggish metabolism as a result of overcompensation of chemical loaded processed foods, a lack of digestive enzymes, mineral deficiencies, and physical and mental exhaustion. The advantage, and this is where the rubber meets the road right here, the advantage of controlled fasting is the detoxifying effect that live fruits and vegetables and their juices have on the body, which is further enhanced by minimizing overall food intake. Under this metabolic environment, growth hormone is elevated and most likely will reach its maximum metabolic efficiency. 
So here's what happens during controlled fasting. One, he says, detoxification occurs. In other words, you're cleansing every day. Two, the body's enzyme pool is reloaded. So that accelerates fat burning and creates what he's saying, an anti-aging effect. Three, insulin drops and is stabilized. So efficient metabolism of carbs and fats. Then the glucagon increases. That's a fat burning hormone. And growth hormone increases to repair tissue and, and help you burn fat. Mm-hmm. So that, that's a little different than just going like cold turkey yeah. on this, you know. So I think the other thing that, that seems to happen is, as I've noticed um, in the past, is, you know, you're manipulating your hormones, you're burning fat, and that's what really helps you. Because by manipulating your hormones, you get maximum metabolic efficiency. It almost alludes to what you did with your parents. Yeah. You know, it's adjusting your metabolism, and that gives you a pretty good way to deal with it. And that's, that's controlled fasting. And, you know, what, what do you think about that and the, the ability to do that? Um, I mean, it's definitely, you know, like we said, it's, it's a lifestyle. You know, mm-hmm. it takes a while to get used to, but... Um, that definitely sounds, it has that structure, you know, um, mm-hmm. but it also gives you that flexibility. Uh, I know you and me talked about yesterday uh, that it, this diet has that flexibility aspect that some other diets necessarily don't. Yes, without question. You know, he, he says in here, he goes, look, he goes, on the warrior diet, the principle of fasting is based on not eating a full meal during the day. Since the undereating phase lasts for most of the day, you can consume certain live foods and should drink lots of water. Naturally stimulating beverages such as coffee and tea are allowed, and a few nutritional supplements are suggested. So he, he does give you some things that you can do with that. I mean, it's, it's interesting. It's not that hard to stay on top of it, yeah. you know? And it's like you got to look at it and say, well, what do you consume? during this under eating phase. So the 20 hours mm-hmm. period of time, he gets into what do you consume? Cause that's, you know, obviously you want to know what is this guy talk about? What do you, what do you eat during this under eating phase? All right. And what's, what's interesting is it's very simple. One live raw fruits and vegetables. So, you know, uh, whatever you want that way, yeah. you can snack on that. I, I, it, when I think about that, I think back to those guys, the Roman warriors foraging in the woods and here's some blueberries or something. Yeah, I don't know if they are or not, yeah, but yeah. whatever it is, that's what they're doing. Um, freshly prepared fruit and vegetable juices. He does caution here the fruit juices and some of the, even some of the vegetable juices like carrot juice have really high sugar content. Yeah. So you, you, you do want to watch that. You could get into some yogurt, uh, kefir, um, and, and some protein shakes if you want, or boiled eggs, hard boiled eggs. Would be another way to go about it. Um, later, I find that softball eggs are even better for you than hard-boiled eggs. If you get the <laughs> right kind of egg, I guess. You yeah. Know? And, and you know, the optional handful of raw almonds starting in the afternoon hours. Uh, so that's about it. I mean, it's, yeah. you could see that you could have that stuff. And what happens is you're loading your enzymes up all day long. And then when it comes to the next phase, the overeating phase, is when you your body is, according to Ori, in a position where it can digest the foods better mm. if you eat them in the proper order, in the proper fashion. All right? Okay. All right? And that, that's, you know, he's basically saying here, when you're ready to get into overeating, that's where I guess the fun begins. But he also says something that you actually alluded to, and I don't know if you realized it, Matt, is... You talked about when you work out. Yeah. See, in here, this is a quarter of a century ago when we wrote this book. The first thing, he's telling people you eat at the end of your intermittent fast or controlled fasting. Yeah. I mean, you work out then. Okay? Yeah. So if you That's... work out, let's say I decide, hey, from 6 to 10 p.m. is my four-hour window to feast. Mm-hmm. All right? So if I go work out at 5 o'clock, 4 o'clock. You're going to burn more. Yes. And you're going to recuperate better too because it's like right before yeah it's at the end and at the beginning isn't that great yeah it's right yeah. in between I, uh chris shank told me that too that that's that's why i started doing it like crazy? that and, um 
obviously and this guy wrote this book before Noah was born. So I mean, yeah, you know, it's, yeah. it's pretty neat that he he saw that sure. as a benefit. Um, so now let's start. Uh, let's feast. Okay, <laughs> let's get after this and see what happens. Okay, so the overeating phase is after after this occurs. Now, I would be remiss. I'm not going to get into it in this book specifically, but there's a whole section in here on workouts that he that are in the warrior diet, mm -hmm. uh, warrior protocol, I guess, that you can do at that point of the day. And there, there are workouts without heavy with weights, their body yeah. weight type workouts, which seem to be so in vogue today yeah. with, with players having, you know, to well, be, uh, that's, that's, that's what I started doing too. I don't use weights. Yeah. To do it. I, I actually joined the DDP yoga. Okay. If you've ever heard of that. You probably, no, yeah. but okay. He's old, he's old school wrestler, Diamond Dallas Page. Okay. Love, love the diamond cutter and everything. And he's been doing this for years, but um, it's just, it picked up a lot of popularity. And I said, it's like nine bucks a month. It's like paying for Netflix or something like that. And all the workouts are on demand on his thing. And I mean, it's, it's not yoga as yeah. much as it's, it's a real work. Like it's a tough yeah, it's workout. A and work. okay. um, what was cool about it is, I mean, I wasn't in great shape starting out a month ago and uh gives you a lot of there's beginner workouts and it works his way up mm -hmm. and i'm doing a lot of the harder stuff now but every workout you got modifications and things like that oh, you know? good. so yeah. i'm but I, when i'm done i'm exhausted and, and what I'm, is that called is it it's called ddp yoga okay so put the link on there yeah ddpyoga.com yeah, and it's i mean i'm i'm uh it's it's a little corny like i'll, I'll tell you that i'm not big on like the whole like like yelling, getting into the workout with the group and all that stuff. Oh, okay. Like, just let me. I do thought the you would be. I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> I don't know if that was sarcasm. Yeah. <laughs> um. Not a. Yeah. Not a big. Uh, rah rah guy. Let's put it that yeah. way. And it, they do some stuff like that. But it's. I mean, it's it's great. I've been doing some of the workouts they post like every week or something like that. And it's. I mean, I, I do that for an hour and then I go eat and yeah. and no weights. It's all body I like weight. It and I'm checking it out it's it's tough yeah no i think it's great yeah. i mean it's a good way to go about it yeah you know so, so that gives you an idea before we get into the feasting the overeating phase and what it all entails and he says here he goes you've now reached the point that it's time to eat your main meal your body is conditionally depleted of carbohydrates your hormone levels are at their height and their effects are accelerated even more if you if even more if you've just exercised, which we just talked about mm -hmm. doing. Your growth hormone is picked up, and your enzyme pool, which I really like here, is fully loaded. Uh, and one thing I like about this, and I don't know if you guys have had there, it's on this. He talks about it. Another point is fermented foods. Those are really good raw foods as well. Um, kimchi. You know, mm -hmm. if you've had that, uh, there's all kinds of fermented foods out there that are really good that help that, uh, you know, the, the probiotics and yeah. everything in your system. That's another good thing to load in into your diet. And that, that would be in, in the uh, under eating and overeating phase. All right. So, um, so he goes through this, he goes, most important, your insulin level is at peak sensitivities, which, which is one of the biggest advantages of the warrior diet. Put simply, your body is now ready to consume large amounts of food without gaining weight. He's not counting calories. He doesn't count. He doesn't care about calories. My favorite because, part. Well, you know, because <laughs> what he's saying here is this is the best time to eat as much as you need and enjoy this wonderful sense of freedom. Yeah. I have heard, I, and I, I actually watched somebody talking about Ori Hoffmeckler. When he is out, people are almost shocked how much food he eats. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's amazing. This guy is, you know, you you can look him up on the website. He's he's ten years older than me. He's sixty eight, you know. And he's I wish I was as fit as this guy, you know. <laughs> but but it's sort of he's been doing this forever, you know, for a long time. So the overeating principles, all right? Overeating sounds like a lot of fun. As a matter of fact, it is. But there is an order to this pigging out thing. You need to know how to overeat during your main meal. The overeating principles are based on three rules of eating. And we'll get into the details of these three rules. Rule one is always start with subtle tasting foods and move to more aggressive. Rule two, include as many tastes, textures, colors, and aromas as possible in your main meal. 
Rule three, stop eating when you feel more thirsty than hungry. Hmm. Okay. So that's, that's how he goes about this. And as, as he's looking at this, and what really seems to make a lot of sense is what, why is he doing this? You know, what, what, what is he really trying to get out of this? And here's the goals of overeating before we get into those, some of the specifics here. One, it enhances your recuperation, repairing tissues, building muscles. It boosts your metabolism, replenishes your energy reserves, nourish your body and mind while providing a sense of pleasure and full satisfaction. The issue with a lot of diets is it's, you know, it's deprivation. You're, you're, mm-hmm. you're not getting some here. There's very little that you cannot have. And we'll get into the couple of exceptions here. Experience a sense of freedom, guilt-free and retrain to eat instinctively. So that's, you know, where this thing goes. So you're, there is a science to this overeating and how, you know, he gets into it and takes a deep dive into it. I mean, you know, what do you think of just initially the concept of those three rules of eating? Yeah. All right. You want to know like, well, what's in all this? Yeah. Stuff, what's, right? what, what's the, any restrictions? Because if there aren't any restrictions, then yeah. there are, there's a couple of restrictions at the yeah. very end. I'll, okay. In a minute, I'll tell you, but let's look at the first rule where he says, always start with subtle tasting foods and move to more aggressive tasting foods. And what happens when you look at this is, you begin the overeating phase with live, raw, leafy green vegetables, mm-hmm. a salad, okay? The greener they are, the better they are. And the denser they are, the better it is. Starting with a mixed green salad is a good choice. A handful of parsley, cucumber, le- endive leaves, mm-hmm. any vegetables, and you sort of like build it from a green salad through, you know, get after some tomatoes, onions, olives, you can see the order, how it comes along where you're going with subtle tasting foods, moving to the more aggressive tasting yeah. foods. Okay? So, be, and he's saying a lot of it was because your stomach lining is so sensitive that yeah. this helps you to absorb these nutrients. Because if you eat the salad later or those type of things, there's all these other foods in the stomach lining. Sure. lining. You're not getting the, the, the maximum nutrients as he's recommending here. So... I mean, it's good, you know, it's, 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 you know, he's got some things in here specific to that, but after you get through that and you get into the second rule where he says, include as many tastes, textures, colors, and aromas as possible in your main meal. You know, and and when I hear that, I don't, I don't know. At first I didn't think about eating as much as like, I don't know, the picture I have in my mind is I'm under the you know, I'm by the ocean, the sun, you know, the, the moon is coming up. It's like, and you, and you smell the food. You, mm-hmm. you have all, it's not just the eating of it. It's sort of yeah. like the feasting sure. part. This is the, you know, the next part of this thing. And he goes, it is my strong belief that you should try to include as many tastes, textures, colors, and aromas as possible in your main meal, because doing so will deliver a complete feeling of sa- satiety, uh, satiety. Is that how you say it? Satiety? Mm. Fullness. All right. All right. If you miss even one of them on a regular basis, after a while, you'll probably develop food cravings. So he's just saying, eat a bunch of different types of things and start to build into that as you, as you go there. So that's, that is your main meal that he's talking about that. And the third rule where he talks about stop eating when you feel much more thirsty than hungry, you know, that makes a bunch of sense. I mean, you know, it's one of those things you eat, 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 and then when you don't want to eat anymore and all you want to do is drink, then take a break for 20 minutes. And if yeah. you're still hungry, he says, go eat. Yeah. Th- there is no limit yeah. within that four-hour window where you get to feast. Right. And he says, you'll, you'll stop eating instinctively at yeah. that point. Yeah. And, and you'll feel fantastic. I mean, you know, that's fascinating. And here you go, Matt. He will tell you, and it's a few pages later on page 85, there are only two things not allowed on the warrior diet. Okay. Okay? And we actually alluded to them, and I know what they are, but I'm just going to pull up the page for you here. All right, here you go. What is not allowed on the warrior diet? (laughs) Almost everything is allowed on the warrior diet, but there are a few exceptions. One, refined sugar. Okay. Okay. Two, refined processed pastries. 
Okay. Okay. So even like when you look at like, oh, you can you have bread? Yes, you can have bread. Yeah. All right. It's just later in the meal. The carbohydrates yeah. right. are later in the meal. So you're going if you look at that so meal dessert. that way. Yeah, it can be. Yeah. A lot of times they'll put honey on the bread with sure. butter. Delicious. I mean, you know, whatever it might be, it, yeah. it would be a way to, yeah. you know, that, that that goes that way. So it's like, okay, so you can pretty much have everything. It's just. That's how I'm eating now. So. It's not bad, right? <laughs> I mean, I can see myself doing that. Yeah. I mean, could you do that, No. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Feasting is not a bad deal. One no. big meal a day. Yeah, and it is, and it's pretty interesting, and it's just, for me, it will be the creativity of mixing certain things, sure. just so I have that together, but, you know, he has, you know, all kinds of different things you can have all mm -hmm. on this diet, and, and, and that's why I would tell you to get the book, um, and I know a lot of people out there will certainly do that if they're intrigued to, to move forward on something like this. Now... Let's, let's, as we move forward on this, before we get to the final phase of this podcast, is the idea of the warrior diet, just the idea of it, the lifestyle that we're talking about here. And he goes here, the warrior diet, as I've said before, is not just a diet. It's a way of life. It is, as you know by now, based on triggering the warrior instinct through a daily cycle of undereating and overeating. Since this is a controversial diet that challenges conventional rules, I consider it important where he takes a look at diet, nutrition, instincts, sense of freedom. Because I think that's what is different about this, because you do have that sense of freedom. Yeah. It's not like you can't eat anything in the under-eating phase. You can eat all you want in four hours. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's what you got. But in the under-eating phase, you can forage. You, I mean, you, you can have some things in there that, that help you. You can have your coffee, mm -hmm. you know, those types yeah. of things, w which makes some sense. And he talks about how you can, what, what he, about how you can cycle yourself through higher carb days, higher fat days, higher protein days. And he's got a, a whole deal in here that we will have actually in our blog post on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. All right. So that'll, that'll be right after the podcast and we'll create a little. Like here, here's the rules of the game, so to speak, on on how, you know, how to cycle in the warrior diet and and how it works. And, and uh, even if you haven't read the book, you have enough information to take a shot at doing this. So at this point, what I want to share with you is, I am planning on doing the 100 day <laughs> warrior diet challenge, all right? and it will begin on May 31st. Okay, May 31st. So that's a Monday from, uh, following Monday is from today's um, uh, release of the podcast mm -hmm. on the Warrior Diet. There'll be more information on Wednesday on some protocol and a blog yeah. post. And you'll see the video of this on that Friday. But then the following Monday on May, on May 31st, I am going to kick that baby off. And I'm going to do it. Uh, I challenge anybody out there that wants to do it. Yeah to do it. You'll have enough information to get started. I would recommend uh, getting the book if you want. We'll have some other websites with some good articles in there that can help you uh, do that. I would say um, my plan would be starting that Monday, I am going to post every day on Instagram. All right. And there I can have a video. Here's my meal. This is what mm. my day. So I'll give you out there an insight in how it goes. And in, in advance, I'm going to get on the scale. All right. Gotcha. And I'm going to get some quick measurements. I'll video that. I'll yeah. have it for before and after. This isn't necessarily for me to lose weight, although I assume in 100 days of making yeah. this effort, something will happen. Um, I'm even going to get, it's called the Zero app, the one for the iPhone, and I'm sure it's on the Android, where it measures your fasting period. and so, you know, you can phase into this. It's not like completely I'm doing this and only this. Yeah. So you can phase into it. And I think that that will help as I give you some insight about that. And like I said, there'll be some good websites there for you to take a look at and so forth. So uh, we'll have all the links we talked about um, on the website there um, next to the actual audio podcast like we do every Monday. and. Um, 
I don't know. What do you think? No, you want to give it a shot? Uh, I had to talk with Coach Shane, Coach Owens. <laughs> and, you know, I don't want to lose too much weight. You know. Yeah, yeah uh, I wonder. Yeah, but uh, yeah. I mean, it sounds interesting. I'd love to try it out. Well, you'll be feasting. That's the whole thing. Yeah, so I, yeah. you know, you got to think about that. And just anybody out there. I mean, I don't. You know, th this isn't like, uh, hey, go do this. It's more like um, food for thought, literally. You know, yeah. and uh, you know, it looks like Coach Wareham is. Uh, already doing some of this stuff already yeah. without having read the book. You got a few details you didn't have before. I yeah, assume. I'm going to stick with what I'm doing and take some of those things and yeah. get into it. So we'll see well, what happens. I think it's an easy one for coaches going back to what we started talking about in the beginning is, I mean, uh, we work, if we're working 16 hours a day and we need to sleep for yeah. six or seven, you know, you can have a two or three hour period there where you can just go to, go to town. You know, and, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but just, uh, I think the way that I live, I think mm -hmm. this is this has been very beneficial this past month, and I'm hoping in two or three months yeah. I can see some real results and see where I'm at. So. Yeah, I, I think yeah, just and that's what's sort of cool. My my goal on the hundred days that I'm going to be posting stuff on this is my goal is to go through the growing pains of it. And, mm -hmm. and, and I didn't even talk. There was one little section here. He talks about what if you want to go off the warrior diet? He goes, okay, go, yeah. don't worry about it. Just come back. There's to yeah. Just come back. Mm -hmm. Just come back. And as you do it over time, you'll, you'll see the benefits. So I'm going to yeah. find out what this does for me and, um, you know, put this out for everybody sure. to, to, that they can share that. And so follow me on Manny Matt Sackis, um, uh, on Instagram, and that'll be right out there for you you know, to take a look at. Uh, now I want to take a minute here and I want to hit you up with some tips and reminders, give you some insight out there that can help you optimize your life. And this one is a uh, DIY. It's a do it yourself <laughs> bit. Okay. And you know, I, I got all these buddies out there and they're, uh, they're all growing beards. You know, I say, Hey man, hey, check my beard. Yeah. I've had one for a little while and they're growing beards. And what, um, it's important because at first, you know, when you start growing a beard, you get, you get itchy and stuff and you don't realize, oh, you need to, you need to get a proper, um, beard shampoo or beard soap yeah. or, or, you know, cause you, you really want to make sure that, you know, the nutrients are going to your beard and the skin underneath, you know, and, but one of the things most vital, especially, um, you know, throughout the year, there's different recipes I would use is a quality beard oil. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'm going to literally right in front of us right now, I'm going to make for you a, uh, a beard oil that is refreshing and for the summer. Okay. It's a summer beard oil. And, um, I'll share with you how this thing goes and what the different parts are with it. And all you need is just a couple drops a day and you make sure that you put it into your beard. And I'll explain that here in a minute. Now, what you have is at first you have, you, you can use carrier oils. Uh, and the first carrier oil, there's, uh, I'm going to make one ounce total of this beard oil. All right. And, uh, here, here's the, the, the two carrier oils I'm going to use. All right, so you can see them here. Uh, that's one. Uh, I don't know how you say it. Jojoba. 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 Jojoba oil, wow. something like that. Use a half an ounce of that. And then the other one you use is uh, called argon oil. Argon, R-A-R-G-A-N. So those are two right there. And what I do is I get this uh, container because you ideally want, uh, you know, something that is uh, not... It can be glass, but it, you, you don't want to be able to allow the sunlight to go through it. So you want an amber bottle of some sort. And what they, what I usually do in this case is I put in here, uh, just to make it simple, uh, half of this one ounce will come in here, and there's about half. Uh, okay, so just a little bit there. And there we go. Then the next one I put in is the argon oil, which is the same amount as well. Okay. And, you know, since it's a bigger amount, I just pop it in there. And, uh, 
And that is really good for your beard just as a carrier oil and conditions your beard fabulously. Then, because I want to make something refreshing, this is more of a summertime oil, I, what I do is I put uh, in this particular recipe three different types of essential oils in here. And uh, the first one is very refreshing. It's lemon oil, all right? So there's my lemon oil blend. I put five drops of that of lemon oil. Five drops of that. Then the next one I use is eucalyptus, which ah is very nice as well. Ah, there you go. Five drops of that. One, two, three, five. There you go. And then the last thing I use is tea tree oil, all right? or melaleuca, sometimes it's called, all right? That would be the tea tree oil. And you only use three drops of this. Right, so. And that actually relieves itching and okay. so forth. So it's really good for that, you know? So you've Take got- Take notes, Noah. I think that's right. Your beer's gonna be going And then all I do months. is from there, in this particular bottle I've had, you can you can get droppers and so forth, or you could, or I, I like this one here. So I just plug it up. And then I can shake it, mixes the oils, and then you just sort of put about three or four drops in there, all right? And then you take it, but then you can put it underneath <laughs> your beard. Yeah. Okay? And then you, you put it in just like that, and it is refreshing. And uh, here you go, Noah. I want you to give that a try, <laughs> you know? Put a little bit on your Scruff. gr young, growing, scruffy beard. That'll help you out, see what you think. But it is refreshing, and, and it's something that um, I think uh, all those guys out there growing beards um, yeah. would enjoy that. And uh, it's just a good summer recipe. And what I'll probably do, since I plan on keeping my beard year-round like uh, I have been for years, um, is uh, I am, uh, I'll have a, uh, a fall recipe, a winter go. recipe, and a spring recipe. So, I'll, so that's the first of the recipes. And there are a few I like to make these different batches of stuff up. So it's fantastic. So I want to thank you for joining me on the Manny Matt Sackis Show. If you're listening to this podcast, make sure to subscribe in iTunes. There you can give us a rating and comment on the show. If you're watching this on YouTube, subscribe to our YouTube channel, hit the bell so you can get notifications when we release the next show. Feel free to comment on this specific show and then I can answer anything on another, another podcast. If you'd like to get all kinds of updates, Go to our website at mannymatsackis.com, where you will be up to date on Monday, podcast release, Wednesday, a blog post or inside access feature, Friday, a video release of the Manny Matt Sackis Show. Subscribe with your email, right, and you'll get these regular alerts, and as a bonus, you're going to get our uh, latest report, Fill the Stadium, which is a coach's secret formula to build a program and fill your stadium to capacity. And with the pandemic right now, uh, capacity <laughs> at Ohio State went from 105,000 to 20,000, I heard. So, um, yeah. you know, but all this stuff in, 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 the, uh, in the report is valid. Yeah. To help you out. So uh, thanks again, guys. Enjoyed it. Yeah, it was great.